The Boy Who Lived by Louise Charlton Chapter 6 Redemption Dusk was gradually creeping over London, and as Harry walked down the muggle street that contained an entrance to Hyde Park, he absent-mindedly watched the traffic speed by noisily and thought about how little the muggles knew about recent events, what he, Harry, had done for them. He then thought about how Petunia had almost said something to him, how there was a small drop in the muggle population that did have some idea of what had gone on, and smiled despite everything that his aunt had put him through over the years. Having followed a few different paths to no avail, Harry eventually found a spot under the shade of some trees where a solitary bench sat amongst a carpet of petite coloured flowers in an array of colours. There were more subtle white and pastel coloured petals, but there were also some in striking shades of bright yellows, oranges, pinks and blues. Hermione was right. The park really was beautiful. Harry took in the mixture of scents as he took a few steps towards the bench and stuck the plaque onto the back of it, using a permanent sticking charm for the second time that day. But after taking a few steps back, Harry struggled to make out the words on the silver blob that had failed to catch some late evening sun under the cover of the trees. After emerging back onto the busy street, Harry had been so taken aback by how the stars could still shine even after all the recent tragedy that the hustle and bustle of the Saturday night club goers failed to penetrate his senses. It was in this moment of true awe and wonder that Harry felt, just for a few short moments, truly free. It was only the hoot of an owl that cut through Harry's weightless experience, causing him to rise from the railing he had perched on and follow the busy traffic for a short while before crossing, looking for the spot he needed. For once in his life, Harry did not feel unnerved about the eyes that he could feel watching his every move. The danger was gone. He no longer needed to constantly look over his shoulder or run for his very life. Perhaps he truly was free after all. Finding the perfect spot at last, Harry crouched down in the window area of a car dealership full of plush, flashy cars, being eyed by men in posh, expensive suits and money on their minds. Harry did not linger over the view in the window, purposefully pulling out the parchment quill and ink from his jacket pocket and began to write, using the light pouring out of the showroom window. And as Harry read the letter through, he was aware of a large pair of round eyes gazing directly at him from a nearby tree. Looking up expectantly, Harry was startled to see a young businessman in a suit eyeing Harry sympathetically. He had possibly just emerged from a shopping spree in Aston Martin behind him, but as Harry took in the small hazel eyes, he found no warmth or kindness there. It was empty pity, nothing more. I'd move from here if I were you. The old bill are out tonight, the man began, his voice harsh and unfeeling. He then reached into his pocket and took out a couple of gold and silver coins. Here's a couple of quid. Should be enough to get yourself a coffee. He finished as he placed the money onto a piece of Harry's blank parchment. He then turned his back on Harry and flagged down a taxi, getting him without a second glance in Harry's direction. Harry was stunned. He knew that he must look a little shabby after his recent escapades, but he had no idea that he looked unkempt enough to be assumed homeless. Get a haircut, he told himself. Not wishing to attract any more half-hearted sympathy, Harry quickly sealed the letter and held it out to a majestic owl who had flown over from the nearby tree to the railings to Harry's right. Hermes's large round eyes looked straight into Harry's as he held out his legs sedately in expectation of Harry attaching his letter to it. Harry then watched Hermes's silhouette disappear into the distance and smiled, thinking about how he had managed to right some of the wrong that he had caused from the battle. And once he could no longer make out Hermes's majestic figure against the night sky, Harry turned around and walked down the alleyway to find a secluded spot. Now hidden in a dark car park entrance, Harry quickly turned on the spot and exited the muggle world with a loud crack. Once Harry returned to the border of the burrow, he sleepily waded through the long vegetation in the garden and crept through the back door, where he tiptoed past Mrs Weasley, who was finishing the washing up in her dressing gown and slippers. After creeping up the stairs towards Percy's room, Harry stopped just outside Ginny's bedroom door to listen out for her steady, dreamy breathing, but it did not come. Instead, he heard an almost silent groaning. On further investigation, Harry made out the restless figure of Ginny, who was tossing and turning in her bed, mumbling, Not the first years. No, do it to me instead. And with sweat pouring down her face, mixed with her tears, Ginny opened her eyes suddenly. Harry froze on the spot, as Ginny's tortured eyes caught a sliver of moonlight creeping in through a gap in the curtains. She gave a small whimper as she caught sight of Harry. He paced silently over to Ginny's bed, not wishing to disturb Hermione. Ginny reached out for Harry's hand, and his stomach lurched when her soft skin brushed against his. She then asked Harry in a whisper if she could talk to him in Percy's room, and just moments later he found himself sitting on his bed next to Ginny, who was resting her head on his shoulder, her fingers intertwined with his. She then slowly began to tell him about how her dreams would often relive moments from her recent time at Hogwarts, the times when she had taken the beatings for refusing to reveal Harry's whereabouts, and when she had shielded the first year's half-bloods and blood traitors from Cruciatus curses. Harry let Ginny talk uninterrupted, even as his shoulder became gradually more damp. Neither of them cared. 
Harry listened as Ginny relayed the horrors that had gone on at Hogwarts, and felt a tear leave his eye too. Breaking up with Ginny had made no difference. She had still suffered for his sake, even though he had broken her heart. When Harry voiced this, Ginny cut him off. You didn't fail. Ron and Hermione would have done the same if they were there. Neville and Luna got a fair amount, too, and most of the DA. You gave us all a reason to fight against the Carrows. Against you know who. To fight for our freedom and defend the defenceless. Because that's what you've always done, and we were proud to be a part of Dumbledore's army, Ginny proudly stated. And I think, being Ron's sister, they thought that I'd go crying to him, and then they'd somehow get to you. But they underestimated my loyalty and strength, she finished, a small smile on her face, beautiful even in sorrow. The guilt in the pit of Harry's stomach expanded through his whole body. Hearing about all the suffering he had caused made him feel numb and weak. I don't deserve you, Harry feebly supplied. Well, you've got me anyway, and I'm not going anywhere, she replied, stifling a yawn. Harry then kissed her in a vain attempt to thank her for everything she had done, before leading her back to her room. He tucked her in and told her that he loved her as she drifted off to sleep, Harry soothing her until she was taking slow, dreamy breaths. Harry woke suddenly, sitting bolt upright on his bed. The bright morning sunlight streaming in through the window between the undrawn curtains dazzled him. Harry, breakfast ready, came Hermione's gentle voice from the other side of the door. Kay, be there in a minute, Harry replied wearily, slowly adjusting to the bright sunlight. Harry dressed in a daze, and spent several minutes trying to put his t-shirt on before realising that it was actually a pair of pants. He subsequently used summoning charm to find the rest of his clothes. He then made his way downstairs to the kitchen for breakfast, where there were already several redheads at the table, including George, who was a little quiet but seemed much happier than he had been the past few weeks. "'Morning,' George called out as Harry came through the doorway. Everyone, including Ginny, looked up at George's words. This was obviously the first time he had spoken all morning, and now seemed to be the norm. Harry observed that Ginny looked a little tired, but she, too, seemed happier than anyone had seen her in days. She smiled at Harry, causing his stomach to do an energetic somersault. Harry was glad that he had not yet had breakfast. Morning, Harry replied as he flopped into a seat between George and Hermione, begrudgingly putting a good few seats distance from Ginny. The last thing he wanted to do was make a scene with Ron. Harry busied himself with eating his breakfast so as to avoid Ron's burning glare, and Mrs Weasley provided Harry with plenty of opportunities to do this by serving him third helpings of everything. She was clearly on a mission to fatten him up, and as he found himself undoing his belt, he deemed this mission a success. He was finally released from the table when Charlie rose from the table, having had his fill, declaring that he had some letters to write. George rose with Harry, and the two walked together in awkward silence until Harry reached Percy's room, when George suddenly continued on up the stairs towards his room. He had muttered something about paperwork, but Harry was unsure of whether or not this was the truth. But Harry was not left alone with his thoughts for too long, as only a few short minutes passed before there was a gentle knock on the door. Come in, Harry called out, and within a fraction of a second, Ginny was inside the room, her flaming red hair illuminated by the bright sunlight. I just wanted to ask you a quick question, she began, and, not waiting for a response, she continued. You know all that stuff you said to Ron yesterday? Well, did you really mean it? She finished, in this moment looking like the shy ten-year-old Harry had met at King's Cross Station all those years ago, the little girl who had been besotted with him, even back then. Of course I did. Why would I make up something like that? Harry began, taking a few steps towards her. I meant every word, he finished, his lips now so close to hers that they brushed them slightly. He stroked her cheek lightly with his finger and took in her angelic features. Good, Ginny began, breathing a sigh of relief. Because all that stuff I said last night? Well, I'd do it all again if I had to, she finished simply. Harry's heart sank as he thought of how Ginny had suffered all kinds of horrors without a second thought, and found himself loudly protesting about people who should not have done that for him. I'm unworthy, he finished. Ginny took Harry's hand and looked him straight in the eye, burning him with a ferocious stare that would make her mother proud, and began, "'Honestly, Harry, when will you get it into your thick skull that all these people who suffered and died did so willingly, to help create a better world, the one that you would create? And don't give me this whole I'm unworthy nonsense. You're worth so much more than that,' she finished, giving Harry's hand a squeeze. She was right, of course she was, but Harry was still not sure if he could yet forgive himself for the recent damage that he had caused. And perhaps Ginny detected this, as she pulled Harry into a tight hug, which he tried his best to reciprocate. Pulling apart, Ginny commented, At least shower before going to see your godson for the first time. You stink. And as Harry was laughing and thinking about how great Ginny really was, she punched him in the arm. Ow! What was that for? Harry asked as he rubbed his arm, eyes watering beneath his glasses. That's for faking your death, she replied, a sort of rage present in her face. Promise me you'll never do that again, she added, punching him again on the word never. Ow! All right, Ginny! I promise, Harry replied, rubbing his arm again. As Harry headed towards the bathroom for a shower, he could not help grinning. Ginny was back, and just as ferocious as ever. 
As Harry's feet hit solid ground, he took a few minutes to steady himself before heading for the border of a house that he could not remember seeing from the outside, but Andromeda's instructions had been informative, and Harry found it easily. The house had a strange air of both simplicity and grandeur. Andromeda had, after all, once belonged to one of the most prestigious pure-blooded wizarding families, and while she may have been disinherited, it was possible that her uncle Alphard may have left her some money in his will, as he had done for Sirius. But as Harry approached the front door and knocked, he felt a little nervous. He had only met Andromeda once, and if he recalled correctly, he had inadvertently insulted her and tried to curse her. Harry hoped that Andromeda had forgiven him for his outburst, as he had been rather groggy at the time, and she did look rather like her sister Bellatrix. He also wondered what Teddy looked like now. He had only ever seen a picture of him what seemed like many moons ago, and Harry suspected that the little baby with bright turquoise hair had changed a fair bit since then. Harry was greeted by a warm smile which made her black family similarities diminish to the point where only her regal features remained distinct. Andromeda led Harry down a short hallway and into the distinctly familiar living room, where there was a small crib set up in the corner, and inside it lay a baby boy with a shock of bubblegum pink hair, exactly the same shade as his mother's preferred colour. "'That's his favourite one,' Andromeda commented from over Harry's shoulder, having followed his gaze. She gave a weak smile, and Harry noticed that her eyes were glistening in the lamplight. "'Do you want to hold him?' she asked Harry, suddenly springing into action. She had not waited for a response, and Harry soon found himself holding a fragile package wrapped in a blanket." Teddy was fast asleep. Harry froze, petrified of dropping him. The slightest movement in little Teddy could be no more. He then began to mutter and murmur, slowly becoming more and more grisly, but Harry maintained his exact position. But as time ticked by, Harry loosened up, and when Teddy opened his eyes, Harry saw that they were exactly the same shade of green as Lupin's. They stared up at Harry, and after a few minutes of careful observation, Teddy's hair turned to black, and Harry found his heart melting as he looked down at Teddy, a miniature version of himself in many ways. Andromeda had returned from making the tea just as Harry began to tell little Teddy all about his parents, and out of the corner of his eye Harry saw Andromeda wipe away a tear. It was with a pang in the pit of his stomach that Harry continued, realising how difficult it must be for her to look at her grandson every day after losing her only child, and her husband. When Teddy was finally sound asleep, Harry voiced these thoughts to Andromeda, who patted Harry reassuringly on the arm. Nothing was said between them, and yet so many words were spoken that afternoon, as the two comforted each other, united by their own grief.